Hello, my friends. Welcome to the big picture. Welcome to a new week and welcome to another study. This quarter, we're following a theme entitled In the Crucible with Christ. And this week, our study goes by the title Seeing the Invisible. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come to you because we want to say thank you for being an amazing God. Uh, Lord, thank you for being the all-powerful God. Lord, thank you for being the God that touches us individually. I pray, Lord, uh, that we uh, might understand uh, all that you desire of us in our study this week. We ask and we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. It was when I was growing up in the home of my parents that I, I learned some, some very valuable lessons. Mum and Dad certainly saw their, their fair share of life's challenges. Our home was located deep in the, in the working class suburbs of Sydney. Life at home wasn't always easy. My parents didn't have a high quality relationship. Everybody knew that. But then both of them had come with difficult family histories. Both lost their parents at a young age. Neither of them, individually or as a couple, had much support. What hope did they have? Like most parents, however, both mum and dad loved their two boys and aimed to equip them to the extent that they were able. This was a challenge. My dad worked for much of his life labouring in woolen mills, and my mum uh, worked as a, a nurse assistant in, in aged care. At home, the dysfunctional relationship did make life difficult for the entire family, yet somehow lessons were planted that remain to this day. I believe mum's prayer life was primary, but so were the values that both of them displayed. One attribute I came to cherish was their generosity and sacrifice. They weren't rich and they struggled most of their lives. Significantly, however, they had learnt what it was to give. They were generous people. This week, our study is entitled Seeing the Invisible. Most significantly, however, we spend the week considering the generosity and the extravagance of a God who desires to give his people more than they can possibly ask or think. Before we go there, however, why not chat in your fellowship group on the issue of generosity? Perhaps you could ask this question. In your own life or church, is there anyone who's been or, or is a generous giver of money, time or other resources. Is there something about this person that you appreciate even more than the gifts that they're able to give? This question is so applicable in church after church. Do you know, as a pastor, I'm so aware that in every congregation I've ever pastored, these have been blessed uh, often by uh, hidden generous people. They may not be rich, but they are generous. Then there are others who have been totally selfless with the giving of their time. These people have just reinforced the lessons that I first saw at home. But how does this fit in this week's study? This week, we look at the exceeding generosity that originates with the God of heaven. Let's look at all that's presented. Our study on Sunday is entitled Our Father's Extravagance. It refers to one of the most loved passages of all of Paul's writings. This is what he says. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How, how shall he not freely give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? This is such a powerful passage. We could spend the entire discussion time on all that's encapsulated in these verses. So why not chat on this? Perhaps you could ask these questions on two themes. On the first theme, 
On the optimist, pessimist scale, where would you position Paul? Do you think Paul's belief impacts his optimism? The second theme, is there anything that can separate us from the love of God? What about sin? Can sin separate us from the love of God? Or do we simply separate ourselves? Why is this distinction important? On Monday, we come to a wonderfully encouraging passage. This is spoken to the disciples at a time of deep discouragement. Christ has told them that he's going to leave them. His words are aimed to encourage. Just imagine they were spoken to you. This is what he said. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again. He then concludes with an inspiring promise. Ask anything in my name and I will do it. This passage in John 14 has encouraged so many. There's hope for the future and there's reassurance for support for the present. This is, in fact, another passage that's worth chatting about in your fellowship group. Why not try these questions? What do you find the most positive thing about these passages? Do you believe Christ is wanting to be taken literally when he says, ask anything in my name and I will do it? If so, how do you explain the apparent non-realisation of this promise? Is there anything that can stand in the way? On Tuesday, we consider the implications of Jesus' resurrection for our own present day lives. As a result of the resurrection, we now have Jesus placed at the right hand of God. He's sitting in heavenly places. That's the place of position and authority. That's why in the book of Hebrews, we're called to come boldly to the place our requests at the feet of the risen Christ. This thought takes us easily to our study on Wednesday. Uh, the subject for the day is worry. It's probably one of the most relevant subjects for the increasingly secular, fast-paced, unthinking world of this century. My guess is that if you're one of the few people that can go to bed tonight without a worry in the world, you can also afford to be patient because I guarantee that by tomorrow, all that will change. Now again, let's chat about this in your fellowship group. This study emphasises the importance of taking our worries to the God of heaven. But that is vital. But... Is it enough? Why not chat about this in your fellowship group? Perhaps you could ask this question. What are the things that most worry you now? To what extent do you believe my taking all worry to God alone is sufficient? What is the place of other believers in my struggle with the worries and concerns of life? What is the place in ministry of praying with and for others. In dealing with worry, I'm so conscious that this question is just so significant. The power of God is undoubted. But without community, the individual believer can quickly become discouraged. The individual without community is indeed very weak. Finally, as you conclude your fellowship time, why not spend some time in group prayer? Claim the promises of the God who is generous beyond words. Why not take the worries that your fellowship group has discussed to the one who is already reigning in heavenly places? Then witness the generosity and the power of the invisible God. Thank you so much for joining with us. If you'd like to contact us, we can be contacted at the address on your screen. 
If you'd like us to add you to our priority list and would like me to send big picture directly to your smartphone or email address each week, we're more than happy to do just that. Just send your details to the contact point on your screen. May the Lord richly bless you as you continue to struggle with all that Scripture has to share. Thank you so much for joining with us. Thank you.